Welcome to T3 from Game to Reality with Rob Howdle, Oliver Steeples and Douglas Orson. We're going to give a quick talk on Knights of the Old Republic and specifically T3 Utility Droid. We'll talk about how we got the game meshes, sounds and lights and how we developed that into a semi-finished product. Hello, my name's Rob Howdle. I create the Facebook group uh, the T3 Builders, um, like most clubs the t3 builders was originally a yahoo group uh, and i was just hoping to relight the fire as it were by bringing it over to facebook not only in the group do we build the t3 droids but we also have quite a few members that have focused on the t7 droids which are mostly popular in the star wars the old republic online game t3 is a utility droid originally from the video games knights of the old republic 1 and 2 and was later adopted into the popular mobile game galaxy of heroes T3 is one of those droids where people have seen pictures, know little bits and whatnot, but they don't actually know that much about him. T3's appearance has stayed pretty much the same throughout the years, with slight changes here and there, in terms of maybe the shape of his head and some other parts, the colours, and a few textures here and there, but the overall look has stayed true to the original. Uh, he was built on Terrace for Local Crime Lord, and T3's abilities vary from being an exceptional code breaker and computer slicer to featuring many gadgets such as repeating blasters, flamethrowers, ion blasters, my personal favourite, uh, interface arms, audio and sonar scanners, broadcast antennas, and many more. In around 2006, the T3 Builders Group was formed on Yahoo as a mailing list. Like today, they ripped the meshes from the game and produced PDF DXF plans as you can see on the slide. From the Who Builders plans a number of droids were made however this was really limited and maximum of five worldwide. The most noticeable droids are T3 by Mark Enright and T3 by Darth Moose. The Darth Moose droid did actually do a few conventions in the US and there are videos on YouTube if you search for them. I'm going to talk now about how we actually ripped the game meshes. First of all, I do own a copy of Knights of the Old Republic and it's somewhere in my old CD collection. But for the sake of buying the game for £7.19 from Steam, it was a bit of a no-brainer, although I do have to go back and play it. So once the game's installed and you have all the subdirectories, you can install various modding kits. Um, the modding community for Knights of Old Republic sort of was huge, and there's sort of lots of sites dedicated it to them. Some are sort of now defunct, but one that's still live is Deadly Stream, and it has lots of nice utilities available. Um, so you have Kotor Tool and various other. So utilities to rip things from the game. So what people have done is actually rip the meshes, rip images and textures, sort of upgrade, update them and then sort of re-upload them to the game to bring it more up to date with higher textures and looking better. So there are two utilities that are important. Kotor Max here and Kotor Blender here depending on which software you use. Um, Blender is a free product but has a sort of steep learning curve. Um, 3ds Max is expensive but has a 30 day test period. So Knights of the Old Republic has been installed as well as Kotor tool and using the tool it scans the installed game and sees what's available. And you can see all the different messages here. Um, so let's just pick something that looks like it's interesting. There is T3 in here somewhere, but let's pick one I haven't chosen before. Uh, Jedi Council, let's pick Gamma Rian and export it. And just cut over to 3ds Max. and open the gamma in. Uh, 
and this is a gamma rean apparently and you can just about see the shadow and you can tell this is one I haven't prepared before so let's go to one I have prepared before let's just get rid of this when the Kotor tools run it produces various files so if I just look at the gamma rean you'll see it has a TGA texture file another TGA file and the actual model file if I look at T3 I have actually extracted a few files here but the important ones are the MDL and TGA texture maps so moving over to 3ds max I've already loaded a file name in and just do an import of T3 so first of all I'll look at the polygons so by today's standards it's very very rough and ready um, you can see how low texture it is if I just scroll into a head there's not many polygons at all now moving over to the textured map you can see a lot was actually done with textures to make it look detailed so you have a head there and you have all the different panels on top then the eye side eyes and you can see the utility arm when we rip the mesh it actually has these dummy objects so these are used to move the droid or character in the game so this can be pulled up and down to tilt the head this can be pulled back and forward to put the utility arm out and this object here is to actually move T3 and you can see for example down here there are sort of panels on the front of a droid um, and let's just select that again and you can see none of these are actually reflected in the mesh itself it's all done as textures likewise if I go to the side of a foot you can see there's three polygons or four polygons at the side of a foot there's nothing to suggest the round object in the middle so now we move over to Fusion 360 um, I've started using Fusion 360 a lot more these days because it's becoming more and more powerful compared to AutoCAD and 3ds Max which I used to use which were sort of very limited for what they do so I've already saved the T3 mesh in object form from 3ds Max and now I'm just going to insert the object file into Fusion and you can see it's that easy and it should look the same as it did beforehand however it's just missing the texture maps and again you can see how low res the actual files are if I zoom in on the side eyes for example you can see the small eye how low detailed it is and then you've got the utility arm and the neck which is showing as a hexagon so the neck for example did cause questions um, it was like is the bottom of the head really a hexagon or is it supposed to be round and it's just something that's not seen in the game so they've modelled it as low polygon as possible it's only when you look at the Galaxy of Heroes droid you can tell by turning you can see the steps and it is actually a hexagon another reason why sometimes if you extrapolate too much that could have turned into a sort of round circle however that's not the case however when you actually look at these shoulders for example you can see these are obviously sort of rounded and not supposed to be lots of polygons so I've just shown you how we ripped the meshes from the game into Fusion 360 however we've also seen they're so low polygons we can't actually use them for anything good 
So this is where we have to actually look at the texture maps and try and put as much detail into a model as possible and challenges to turn this low polygon into this high polygon model. So this is a sort of test by sort of Douglas Olson who did using the initial files we first had, um, mainly from the Yahoo Groups files as well, incorporating them with the Fusion files and getting this. However, we now know that's not exactly right. As well as the mesh, we also ripped textures, which you can see here. These are two texture files. One is a bump map and one is a texture file. So what you can do is be really clever and cut sections of the texture file out and use them as a canvas in Fusion 360 to apply it to a surface and from there you can actually create a sketch to work out where the panel lines are so you can create a detailed T3. While ripping the meshes from the game I also took lots of screenshots from 3ds Max at various angles in combination with the texture files and bump maps this will allow us to add detail to a finished model. While converting T3's mesh from low polygon to high polygon we looked at various design considerations. The first one was the width of T3. By default it's 744mm wide which is too wide for a standard UK door. So we actually reduced this by reducing the width of the shoulder hubs. This actually maze makes it look better and not as wide and not as fragile. The second main change was to look at all the dimensions and either round them up or round them down. So there were sort of integer millimeter values. This makes producing files and plans a lot easier. Also, as part of the design, I found 200mm Lazy Susans on Amazon and they fit the shoulder hubs and main drive axles really well. Um, this meant it had to sort of make the sort of bottom of T3 slightly wider in order to fit these bearings in. From the game meshes, this allowed me to make a rough body using 12mm ply, the 200mm Lazy Susans for the upper and lower axles and 110mm soil pipes which fit inside the bearings. As you can see here it's quite good although it's only 300mm wide so you don't have a lot of space once everything will be inside but it's a good way to see how big the body is and how it all fits together. Like with R2-D2, the head of T3 is one of the sort of key points of what it is and also it's really large so you don't realise how imposing it is. From the Yahoo group's plans, the profile of the head is actually rounded and when you look at the raw mesh, it's stepped and low polygon. So by naturally extrapolating this, you get a rounded surface. However, when you actually look at Galaxy of Heroes and other books and other documentation, you actually see the head is angled at the top. So it's a bit akin to sort of CSR, CSL plans with R2-D2. And what you actually see isn't what they intended it to be. As Rob said earlier, there are differences between Knights of the Old Republic, Knights of the Old Republic 2 and Galaxy of Heroes. And you can see it here with the head profile changes and also the position of the lights changes slightly depending on which file, which game you look at. Alright, I want to talk about the head design a little bit. My name is Doug Olson, I'm a member of the T3 Builders Group and I'm one of the designers of some of the T3 files uh, for 3D printing. So you see in the head here, um, we have quite a bit of, of 
of challenges. So the original head started out round. Uh, we made some assumptions based on the original game models, and I think Oliver's already spoke about that or mentioned that. Uh, but as I started putting the head together, it became apparent that uh, it was not going to fit on even a 500 millimeter print bed. So you can see I split it into basically nine quadrants. Uh, and this is designed to fit on a print bed. The other thing I wanted to make sure would happen is that uh, you would not need supports when you printed these pieces. So I've tried to do build-in supports and design the pieces you'll see with kind of ovals and that uh, which allows them to print in one orientation and print full. Um, so right now I'm kind of cutting away at the back side with three pieces along the back, um, which are pretty standard. Uh, you see the hex ring at the bottom. Uh, there's two versions of this. There is a, a solid version of the hex ring uh, to print on larger printers, and then there's a four-piece version uh, that I just took away. Right here, uh, you'll you see the two side pieces. These are pretty big pieces. Um, they are they print from the back side up. Uh, so right now you're seeing the back side, which would be on the surface of the printer. And you see me removing these little alignment pins that I've created. Each of those alignment pins is just supposed to sock it in. Uh, we've had some fit issues I'm trying to, to resolve for future prints with that. And then you see on the side here, there is a cutout on the T3 side. So I've added in this support structure here, and I labeled it support because uh, people didn't know with the first couple of versions. Um, there's very little uh, connection at the top there, but it's enough to allow it to, to print in place. And then if the whole print is printed in this kind of orientation on the, uh, on the printer, I'm aligning it here, sorry, um, it'll print in one piece with no support. Um, pretty cool. You see on the top surface there's a, a few of those little holes uh, around on the top surface. That's so that that top plate can be removed by a magnet. Top plate's actually separated into uh, a left and right piece on the front and a left and right piece in the back and then a little top connecting plate that goes right behind the eye. All of it connects by a magnet. Here you see the Four piece hex ring going back on and you see it's got uh, indented holes the idea being these are going to be uh, socket head cap screws that go from the bottom up through the body and then uh, you can use uh, either you know standard bolt or you can use a wing nut to hold them on inside the eye here you'll see that I've created a slot this is more for uh, your standard nut attachment um, this uh, was more because if we had lights behind the eye, I didn't want to have the shadow of the wing nuts shining up, so I tried to recess that and allow for nuts to be in that place. Moving on to kind of some of the other design considerations around the eye, uh, you saw that there was a carrier or a, a kind of cradle to hold the eye. Uh, because the eye is round and is fairly huge. Um, I wanted it to have some extra support so there are five rods that run from the front section through the back section and into that cradle uh, as well as four bolts at the bottom of the cradle that go through all the way to the hex. Um, those five rods you see now the front part uh, connect up with just standard square nuts so uh, it's uh, M3 rods go through and I don't have the length off the top of my head here but it's not it's going to be a custom trim uh, to fit those in but that then secures the front of the eye to the rear of the eye and then the whole eye piece then secures down to the cradle right there so you see there's sockets there on the back of the cradle for the nuts to go in and secure that so the other consideration on the eye is uh, I have the two side eyes here and we're going to move over and, and look at these. Within the, the side eyes, originally the system had, the, the, uh, system, the uh, 
model had the eyes both rotated a little bit too far to the front. Um, when we got some of the better meshes recently, I was able to, to align the head with the mesh, and then uh, that allowed me to realign the eyes. So you see these two front blocks here are virtually identical. Uh, the one I just removed doesn't have a panel because there's no need to get to the eye, these eyes to get them in. Uh, but on this one, I, I added this kind of access panel, which really is only available when you're first putting it together. Once you've got the, the head assembled, uh, the eye will be in place in, the, in there. You see me surrounding the line around here? I'm having some fit issues uh, with that. I'm trying to work through those. Um, trying to make sure that that panel will fit on there and actually not cause stress. Uh, right now, the panel, when it prints, is, is just too big. So that, that line between the panel and the blocker is too, too big. Both of the eyes here are created in such a way that they socket into these little indents. This is, we've got a couple of prints already done uh, where we've shown this off. And then they do have nuts that get uh, set inside where you secure the eye into that with the nut. Uh, right now, they're fairly tight even without nuts uh, holding them in, so um, you can get away without the nut if you, if you want. And then you see this with the eyes back in. If you rotate around here um, to the back side, I'm also put on four uh, screw holes so that we can mount a, uh, a panel to hold the uh, light behind the eye. And the, those will hold that. Here is a 3D printed head by Jeff Cowman using Doug's files. The lights for T3 are actually quite simple. He has three little pies and only two of them have any form of animation. In Knights of Republic 1 and 2 games, his main eye is lit up a couple of different colours and they are lit up almost in rings which look really nice. The large eye and the small eye to the side of T3's head in the game are just a single colour and they both fade in and out at the same time. This is probably due to the limited technology at the time as well as low resolution graphics. The Galaxy of Heroes T3 tidied up the lights a bit more, they made them a bit brighter, uh, they took out the animation for the small eye and the large eye but other than that there wasn't really that much difference. When we were designing the lights for the eyes and plan on what we'd use. We settled on using the Neo Pixel rings to light up the eyes and I tried to keep them true to the original lights where I could. The main eyes LEDs alternate between a blue and a white colour and I tried to use this to simulate a thinking sort of look similar to R2's PSIs. And the small and large eye fade in and out with the same colour and I would like to thank Craig Pay for the assistance on this as this part of the sketch is actually based off his BT1 main eye sketch. Like with any project, research is really important and this is one of the reasons why. If you assumed T3s like R2D2 a neck would turn with a head, however by looking at the in-game videos you can see the head pans and tilts on its own and rotates. Where is the neck stays put apart from one little twitch forward of a neck? Now there are different ways to sort of do the head and neck rotation and now we'll look at two different options. The first by Doug using spherical manipulators and the second by Oliver using universal joints. Hello, this is Doug Olson. I'm going to talk about the neck mechanism real quick for T3 that I've designed. So I've designed this around something called a spherical parallel manipulator. I'm showing off here on the video the connection between the head and the neck. So it's a three-pronged connection here, this little uh, triangle um, pattern. And then it bolts through, through the bottom pieces uh, of the hex up through the uh, connections in the body. Uh, or add there all the way through so you get a solid connection all the way through uh, to the mechanism. Pulling away the head you can see the outline of this structure here. Um, we've got the trifold or tri uh, pronged piece there and then I'm going to pull the neck piece away here so you can see the mechanism inside. The neck is held on by a couple magnets on either side and then it sockets down into a slot uh, between the head and this base. Um, I'm going to take and 
put the uh, body up so you'll see that in a second, but I want to talk about this mechanism. So this is called a spherical parallel manipulator mechanism. And what it does is there are three main gears that you can see in the middle, and that each of those gears is connected to a continuous rotation servo. Depending on the direction those servos run, all of them can run the same, same way and basically you do rotation, or each can, can run partially, uh, which will allow you to do tilt mo motions uh, on that plate. So you get rotation, pitch, and yaw off of that uh, connection. Those arms uh, all run parallel to a plane, so uh, you can see the control arms coming up here. I'm going to switch over and actually show you one of these uh, off of YouTube that was built. This is a kind of the what inspired me to, to design this. So you can see as each servo moves an arm, the arms move independently, and the pivoting allows you to have that plate at the top, which would be the head, uh, tilting in different directions or doing full rotations. I'm using continuous rotation servos. Um, I may end up redesigning that to use stepper motors at some point, depending on whether they're going to end up being powerful enough for the head. Now here's ours. Uh, this is the one I've designed, and you can see the same thing. Here we go with the spinning, um, just using some servo, servo manipulators, um, not a full control yet. You can see it spins fairly clean, and uh, it's fairly fast. So anyway. Thank you. That's uh, all I've got for today. Like R2-D2, having the head animated is one of the key points and what gives it its character. So in order to do this, you need to have a decent neck mechanism. And I started looking at various options that are available. And you have things like sort of spherical manipulators, which Doug's looking at and you can use sort of ball and socket joints um, however ball and socket joints can actually sort of twist as well unless you lock them so one of the things i've sort of used in the past and sort of looked at now is sort of universal joints this also gives us the ability to add gearing to the head so the servos typically have a 90 degree in total swing but we only want the head to tilt 40 degrees in total. So by using a sort of 9 to 4 gear ratio, we can only have the head turn a certain amount. And this also will reduce some of the servo jitter you naturally get when the sort of servos tilt. And especially once you add a bit of load in the head, you'll stop it trying to overcompensate and wobbling. So as you can see here in various photos, um, I've used sort of two servos for pan and tilt and a gear on the main ring of the base of the R2 or RT3's head for the rotation. So in some previous videos you've seen my test body and test sort of universal joint neck. Now here's four videos that I filmed sort of during my gradual test build in the shed showing the universal joint working, the heads moving, at auto head levelling and a sort of test Galaxy of Heroes head I made. Another quick video, I've mocked up the tilt mechanism, um, although I ran out of channels on a remote control transmitter so I've had to borrow the steering and driving. So and also spot the deliberate mistake, I put the gear at just here, front corner, because that's where it nicely fit and not interfere. Um, and I've put, God knows, uh, 120 degrees of gearing here, but I should have continued the gearing round to here because it doesn't fully turn properly. And just have a look. So it's motors too fast I know that but it's just a test one I had to hand so that's about forward and now we have a pan and tilt which I had before and that should hopefully be a nice speed actually that's forward and then pan and tilt again 
it might be a bit fast, but it might be turning back a bit. It just depends once it's got a fire head on. Here's a quick explanation of the universal joints neck rotation and pan tilt mechanism. So I have two servos here and here for pan and tilt and it forms a universal joints at the top so it can turn in two dimensions. And then there's a gear here which will be driven by another motor to actually turn the head. So currently I'm using an Arduino Uno here and it's taking angles from the head from an MPU 6050 here. From there it gets shown on a standard I2C LCD screen just so I can see the pitch and roll of the heads as it's good to see what's happening and then longer term when I upgrade the UNO to like an ESP32 for more processing power it will take RC inputs from here so it actually overrides the head signal coming in and so once a body tilts the head stays level and then the RC can override it. This is the auto head levelling demo for T3. The RC input isn't activated yet, the Arduino Uno you know, isn't up to it. So the NeoPixel strip shows the angle and if I go up the head levels and then as I turn it the head compensates. Here is a mock-up I did of the T3 heads from the Galaxy of Heroes profile. You can see at the bottom there is actually a slight angle here, which it doesn't have in Knights of the Old Republic. I did this mainly as a load for the servos and the 20 kilo servos I'm using easily tilt this head. Um, also used up quite a bit of 12mm ply I had lying around, but it also shows you the size of a head. So earlier we spoke about the standard door width in the UK of being about 740mm. This head is 600mm wide or about two foot, so you can actually get a rough idea of the size. And you can see it pans and tilts and turns on the universal joints quite happily. By watching game videos you can see how much T3's body actually tilts forwards and backwards and this happens as he moves as he goes up to doors and sort of opening boxes for example. The movement of T3 in games is really impractical for a real life sort of droid, however we can simulate it as much as possible so the body does raise and lower and to get a general impression of it tilting. From using Fusion 360 and joints I was able to work out a body tilt of up to 10 to 15 degrees looks right and it's not overly stretching T3. Using my test body and a spare linear actuator from my R2D2232 I mocked up a body tilt. It uses a simple servo with micro switches for an up and down. There's no position control at the moment but going forward the actuator does have a potentiometer 
and this will be used for precision body tilt. And here is a video of the actuator test. Using a 4 inch actuator swing it takes about 8 seconds to go from one extreme to the other. In a later test I actually decreased the swing to 3 inches and that's about a 6 second swing and that's a lot better than the video shown here. Here's a test of the drive system using 268kV brushless motors with 16 to 1 main box P60 gearboxes. Using a 5 inch wheel it's far too fast for a T3 but it's ideal for R2D2. I need to sort of gear it down a bit more so it's slower. One of the problems is when you actually turn it because T3 is longer it will whip the front legs round so you either need to control the proportionality of the turning or have a slower droid in general. With T3 one of the challenges is going to be control. With an R2D2 it's pretty simple in comparison because you have one stick for drive and another st stick for dome rotation so you're only really using three channels however T3 using same sort of single stick for drive for two channels then you've got head rotation head pitch head roll and all of these are proportional so you need five proportional channels and then if you're doing body tilt you need a body tilt as well so there are different options to this you could use a sort of modified sort of Padawan 360 or some type of traditional RC remotes as shown here the sounds are a bit more complicated than the lights since T3 has not been in any movies or anything yet no specific set of sounds have been created in the game he mostly reuses R2 sounds although he does actually have a few of his own that are not used by R2 and you can listen to some of those now. Somebody online managed to rip a good couple of T3 sounds to MP3 files and publish them, but there was only around 10 of them, which wasn't really that good. Having the game on Steam, I attempted to go into the files and get the audio of T3, but the problem was when you tried to play those files, they weren't actually audio files. Instead, they showed a form of a hexadecimal code or something that the game translates into sound, but for what we wanted, that wasn't any good. After a bit of searching, I came across somebody who created a .sh bash file that you run within that folder, and what it does is it converts the files into an actual audio MP3 file that you can then play. The particular one that I found was made for Knights of the Old Republic 1, but it wasn't that difficult to adapt it for Knights of the Old Republic 2. And then it was a case of going through every single folder within both games and converting all the sounds for T3, which now gives us a nice total of 92 T3 sounds, which then prompted me to adapt the Padawan 360 system to give it more triggers to play the T3 sounds. I took the leap of trying to adapt the Padawan 360 for T3 to allow more builders the ability to build the droid using this system since it's already extremely popular with droids like R2. It currently consists of extra triggers for the audio files and when it's completed it will have the ability hopefully to control T3's head and being able to move it in the various directions. We already have a couple of ideas on how we're going to do this and we're currently in the planning stages of figuring out the best way to achieve this. So I want to talk about the gun on the top of TA3's head real quick. One of the challenges in designing the model for T3 is that this gun lifts parallel to the body as you see in the video here. And it does so with a single support. So rather than have two different servos trying to calculate the balance between them, what I did in my model was I created a structure that surrounds two, two control rods. So this does a parallel manipulation. 
within that uh, support rod. I'm going to zoom in here and remove some of the other surrounding material so you can see a little bit better. But really what happens here is as the servo, which is attached to the very bottom of that support arm, rotates, there are two rods that are connected to offset hard points. So the gun at the top doesn't have anything that it rotates around. It's actually just got two rods. And uh, in this case, you know, you can use just a piece of bent rod um, to do this. And you can see there's two holes at the bottom, two holes at the top, and those stay in parallel to one another uh, as they go up and down, which allows that whole gun carriage to lift and lower and stay parallel to its uh, original base. So, hope you guys enjoy that, and uh, we're really open that, that all of these uh, pieces work together the way we want. So here's a quick demo of the front wheels I plan to use. So it's a standard, cheap um, Omni wheel. And later on, I'll migrate to a VEX Omni wheel because they're better. Um, at the moment, it's just a four inch and it's level with the ground. And I've got one on each foot. As the body tilts, as you'd expect, wheels stay level with the ground and up. So the plan is to have a mobile foot which is purely decorative that goes here and the other side and on the other foot it's using some type of linkage or servo control as the body tilts it will know the angle so the actual foot itself will stay level with the ground this will probably be using some type of MPU 6050 as I'm actually using with the head as you've seen from the various slides and videos, the T3 Builders Group is still very much in its infancy. Um, we still haven't got sort of full plans for T3, sort of worked out mechanisms or sort of full electronics yet. And part of that is what makes the group exciting. When you look at the R2 Builders Group, we've had 20 years of sort of development, BB8s have had five years and DOs have had a year. Knights of the Old Republic is now 17 years old so going forward it will be nice to have droids to take to events and to show off and this as I've just said is really exciting so if you are interested please join the Facebook group and T3 forum listed here.